I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Today, you're going to see a ready-to-fly racing slash freestyle quad that totally knocked my socks off the first time I flew it. And I don't say that lightly. And I think it says a lot about what makes a quad fly good. Uh, and, and hint, hint, it's not just the biggest motors. <laughs> Stay tuned. This is the Holy Bro Copus 1. I'm not 100% sure I'm saying the name right, but it's got just one P there, so I'm going to say Copus. Um, and it's a ready-to-fly uh, racing quad. The pedantic among you will point out that it is not a ready-to-fly because it doesn't come with a transmitter. It is a uh, bind-and-fly, I guess, technically. You can order it with a FreeSky receiver, or you can order it with no receiver, and, and you can put your own receiver in, in which case it would be a plug-and-fly. Okay, but they're calling it a bind-and-fly. And I f first learned about this quad when Holy Bro sent me one. They said, hey, we got this new quad. And I was working on the Shuriken X1 at the time. I had no idea they were even developing this. And the first time I flew it, I was just astounded at how well it flew. Um, it, I don't mean that out of the box it had a perfect tune. When I show you the flight video, you'll be able to nitpick the tune a little bit. I just mean that it just flew so well it just was a joy to fly it felt liberating it felt free it felt like you could just do whatever you wanted to do you know the moment where you're thinking hey i'm gonna try this new move i'm gonna do this i'm gonna shoot that gap or i'm gonna and you're not sure you're gonna pull it off but for some reason when i was flying this quad i just felt confident i could just felt like i could do whatever i wanted to do something about this quad just works and I'm really pleased to show it to you. But before we open the box, and I have left this box completely in its shrink wrap so you can see exactly how it comes out, let's just take a look at some flight footage and you'll, then we'll get back and we'll look at the bench. <laughs> Before we get any further into this review, I do have to get the conflict of interest disclaimer out of the way. I wrote the manual for this quadcopter, and yeah, Holy Bro paid me to write the manual. And they kind of paid me a lot, because I wanted to put in the manual everything that you could need to know when you get this quadcopter home and you're getting ready to 
get to, to fly it. So how to set your channel endpoints correctly in your transmitter, how to set, uh, how to get your channel mapping right, how to install Betaflight on your computer if you need to do that, how to bind your transmitter, uh, and not just how to bind your Tyrannus, but also how to bind your Spectrum and your Flysky Triffer. So for all of these instructions, I put three sets of instructions in the manual, how to, how to put your freaking props on. And I kept going back to, to Holy Bro and saying, hey, can I put this in the manual? And they would just say yes, yes. Even though every time they did, it was another, another you know, check that they had to write me to more hours on the clock. So I actually, I think Holy Bro deserves to be commended because so many companies would release a great quadcopter and people get it and they have no freaking idea what to do with it. And I know you're out there because you asked me what to do with it. And Holy Bro put their money where their mouth was. They paid somebody to make a manual for how do this freaking quadcopter works. And if you if that matters to you, then you should re you should reward them by buying their products as long as they're good products, of course. I will say that even if you don't end up buying this quadcopter, you should go download the manual for the Holy Bro Copus and you should read it if you use Betaflight at all. Because if I were to write a, like a Betaflight 101 that would be it. So I kind of did. And it talks about the Copas, but it talks, you know, you bind any free sky receiver or spectrum receiver, the setup is the same. So go check that manual out. Anyway, on to the rest of the review. So then let's do a rundown of the parts that are on this quad. And they're pretty decent parts. The flight controller is the Kakute All-in-One F4 flight controller. And you may be surprised to see that it doesn't have soft mounting. Don't flight controllers need soft mounting these days? And the reason for that is that if you can kind of see right in there, that's the gyro right there. And it's on a piece of foam. The Kakute has a soft mounted gyro. So the flight controller itself doesn't need to be soft mounted. You can go check out my review of the Kakute F4 AIO if you so desire. The video transmitter is the Adelatl. Uh, and I've talked before about how much I love this MMCX connector. It is so much better than the IPEX, the tiny little IPEX connector that's on things like the TBS Unify that's always coming off. Sometimes it just pulls clean off the board. Sometimes the antenna pops off. It's very difficult. It's, it's not actually made for very many mating cycles and unmating cycles. Mm, kinky. This guy, the MMCX, is made for a lot of mating cycles. It gets around. And it holds on, too. It holds on. It's much more secure and much more durable. I love it. I hope we see a lot more video transmitters with MMCX connectors on them. If you take a close look at the Adelatl, you may be surprised to see it doesn't have any buttons or anything for changing channels. And the reason for that is that it uses a protocol. It's like smart audio, but it's actually tramp telemetry protocol. Same thing from your perspective, basically. Uh, it uses that protocol to let you change your transmit power and your channel from within the Betaflight OSD. And yes, the board does have Betaflight OSD built in, so you can see your voltage, your amps, your milliamp hours, all that nice stuff from uh, within your, your camera. So you change the settings from the OSD, or if you've got a Tyrannus running Lua scripts, you can change them from your Tyrannus, which is nice. As a side note, I've really come to prefer Lua scripts to the OSD these days. And the big reason is that it's much easier to kind of glance down at my Tyrannus and just push a few buttons before I put my goggles on, as opposed to putting my goggles on and then kind of moving the sticks around. But the real advantage of Lua scripts to me is that they let me change the settings even if I don't know what channel the copter is on. So if I've got a copter and I don't remember where, you know, what was it on the last time I flew? I don't have to search with my goggles. I just have to go into my Tyrannus and set it to the channel that I want. Really nice. I have a video on how to set up Lua scripts on your Tyrannus as well. I'll link to that with a card in the upper right hand corner of the screen if you uh, want to check that out. The camera is a place where a lot of ready to fly quads skimp. They put some terrible camera on there. You don't know the difference. Uh, and you go flying and like the sun shines the wrong way on it, the image blacks out, you crash, you just have a bad experience. Holy Bro has not skimped on the camera. They have put a micro run cam Swift or a mini, mini run cam Swift on here. I've said that the mini run cam Swift kind of doesn't have a point because it's not any lighter than the full size Swift and it's harder to mount. But this frame has been built around the mini Swift at which point, sure, yeah, it's smaller, what the heck? And it's a great camera with great image quality. You're not gonna be disappointed there. The motors are T-Motor Air 2450 KV. And this is an interesting choice because these are not cutting edge motors. 
They're not some beastly 2306. They're solid motors, and they've always been the choice of people who are choosing efficiency over performance, which is why it really surprised me the first time I flew this quad, and it flew so freaking good. And I don't know what makes it fly so good. Is it the weight? It comes in just around 300, 315 grams, uh, which is not ultra light. It's not heavy either. Uh, I really don't know, and I couldn't tell you. But it flies really good, even with these smaller motors on it. And it's certainly something worth keeping in mind as we all reach towards ultra big, ultra powerful, ultra ham, amp hungry, ham hungry, amp hungry motors uh, that, that maybe that's not the be all end all of performance. That being said, I guarantee you if we put a nice beastly set of 2306s on here, like T-Motor F43s, the quad would fly better. There's no doubt about it. But it flies really good even with these relatively weak, relatively weak, frankly, motors. I mean, they're not weak, but compared to a T-Motor F43 or a Hype Train, yeah, they're weak. The one downside of these motors is that historically they haven't been very durable. And there's no reason to expect that that'll change here. So if you do intend to crash this quad quite a lot, you should probably consider getting some spares. Now you can't see the ESCs here because they're covered in this nice heat shrink, uh, but they are D-Shot 1200 BL Heli 32 ESCs. So they're the cutting edge latest ESCs. Uh, and they're mounted on the underside of the arms. And the reason for that is that if you bend a prop down and the prop strikes, it's not, it's not able to strike the ESC. It's not even able to hit the wires. You see they've cleverly routed the wires so they're completely out of the way. And this is a really nice touch that they've done just to make the quad that much more durable. The ESC being on the underside of the arm slightly makes it more likely that it will be hit when you're doing a hard landing, especially if the battery comes off. So this is a bottom mounted battery and in general on landing the battery is going to take the hit. So if you're flying in a car park or someplace with asphalt or concrete, you're going to want to have, they've got a little battery pad here, but it's just a piece of carbon and it's not great. You might think about putting some kind of TPU printed battery pad on. Uh, the ESCs are relatively well protected by the battery, but if the battery were to come flying off in a crash, the ESCs might take a hit. And you can't see this. I'm not going to unwrap the ESC to show you, but if you look inside there, you can see they have soft mounted it with some rubber tape and they have a plastic cover on here to just help protect the ESC just that little bit more. The mounting for the video antenna is really intelligent. I'm so impressed with, it, with what they've done here. And I know you guys are now gonna fill up the comments showing me all the people I didn't know about who did it before, but this is the first time I saw it and I'm super impressed. There's been a trend that started some time ago to run the, we used to run them out the top plate sticking up straight. And the problem with that is that when a tree branch comes along and shears off the top, it knocks that antenna off and breaks it. So then people started mounting them straight out the back. Mr. Steele was the first person I saw do that. And at first I was skeptical, but I've become convinced that the durability benefits are, are so, so worth it. But the problem with that is that, especially on quads with this low top deck, running the antenna straight out the back puts it right on the prop line and that's no good. What you then end up doing is constantly bending the antenna up and then bends down and be bend it up and it bends down and eventually it ends up in the props and then you're screwed. So Holy Bro have just gone the rest of the way. They say, screw it, let's put, let's bend the antenna down. And there is a nice metal bracket here that's bolted to the bottom plate that has the antenna coming out angled slightly down. And what that means is that it is out of the prop line. It's completely out of the way of the props. On top of that, it is really well protected from impacts. If you think about it, the motors and the arms are going to protect the antenna from an impact. And well, I mean, the antenna is never going to protect the motors and the arms from an impact. If something's going to hit them, it's just going to break the antenna. So the idea here is that these stronger things are helping to protect this weaker thing. And it's, it's really just really smartly done. It's not even in the way when you land. It's not even kind of resting on the ground when you land. Although, again, the battery would be down there to begin with. Now, you might think that, oh, this is not the best from the, from the perspective of RF propagation. And you're right. If we look at the, end of the copter like this, you can see that the, it, the antenna is completely blocked by the body of the quad. But most of the time when you're going to be in that position, you're going to be taking off or landing, and you're going to be so close to yourself it doesn't matter. As soon as you pitch forward to fly, the antenna comes right up and is actually in a pretty good position for RF coverage. It's not bad, um, especially if you have a very low gain antenna where there's not really a big null at the top of the antenna. You're going to be in good shape here. The one place you might get yourself in trouble is if you are far out and for some reason you come to a hover 
for you know for some reason and then you turn to face away, away from yourself away from yourself then the antenna is going to be blocked and if you're far far away from yourself you're going to see a sudden drop in signal strength so my recommendation anytime you not just this antenna but anytime you have an antenna coming straight out the back is especially if you're at a distance don't come to a hover but keep the copter pitched forward and kind of maybe do slow, lazy spirals if you want to maintain position so that the antenna stays pitched up. If you do get yourself in trouble, if you level out and you suddenly lose video, just pitch back forward and you'll be okay. Now, I haven't talked much about the frame, and the frame is a great example of when you do everything right, there's kind of nothing to say, at least for me, for somebody like me who makes his trade complaining about things that people have done wrong. It's five millimeter carbon. So it's good and strong, and yet the quad is still coming in only around 300 grams. If they'd gone to 4 millimeter or even 3 millimeter, they probably could have shaved easily 20 or 30 grams off of there. But they went 5 millimeter, and that's going to make it stronger. The carbon is, uh, I can tell you that it's beveled on the edges, so it's nice to touch. It's not a huge bevel, just enough of a bevel to knock the edge off. So the question of, uh, that Soma, the designer of the Alien, raised about whether beveling carbon makes it weaker... That's a question he raised. I don't know enough about carbon to say if he's right. But he knows a lot about carbon, and if he raises the question, there's some, maybe something to it. Well, so what we've got here is we've got just the tiniest bevel, so maybe, maybe it's not making it that much weaker, but it still feels nice to your fingers. And then on the top plate, uh, we've got 2 millimeter. Is it 2 millimeter? My favorite calipers. Yeah. 2.0. Oh, yes. Oh, I love calipers. I'm so glad I bought these. <laughs> on the top plate, we have two millimeter carbon. So no skimping and putting 1.5 millimeter on there and giving up a little bit of strength. No complaints here. Um, maybe if you were going to take big hits here, you might want to see this a little more beefed up. But um, overall, probably pretty decent. Nice countersunk screws, so nice smooth top there. Just a lot of really nice touches here. The only thing that you're going to have to do when you get this quad to set it up is you're going to have to bind the receiver, which you can see they've got the bind button right here. It's accessible without having to take the top plate off. Very thoughtful. You're going to have to bind the receiver, and you're going to have to affix the antennas. And I've got instructions in the manual for how I suggest you do all of those things. There's also some basic setup steps that you need to do with any transmitter uh, to make sure that it's working correctly with your quad. Things like your channel endpoints, your channel centers, set up your arming mode, and so forth. So this copter comes as close to ready to fly as possible, but since they didn't ship you the, the transmitter, they can't be 100, you know, can't be 100% ready to go. So that is the Holybro Copus uh, ready to fly, plug and play, bind and fly, racing quad. Uh, it's about 300 bucks, and I think it's, I think it's the, like the best value uh, performance for money in terms of a ready to fly quad that you can get today. Uh, I think the only thing that comes close to my mind is the GT200 from Diatone, which is a heavier quad. It came in, I think, at around 360 grams, if my memory is correct, whereas this one's coming in closer to 300, 320. The GT200 has bigger motors. Uh, it doesn't have VTX remote control, so you can't. You have to push a button to change the channel, which, of course, you know is a big deal to me. Um, uh, but overall, I just found the Copus to be more fun to fly. I found it to be really easy to fly and just, just I don't know, I liked it better. Uh, the, the GT200 was fast in a straight line and powerful, but didn't like knock my socks off with how great it flew. So, so that, there you go. Um, yeah, there you go. That's the Copus. Product link is in the video description, of course. You leave any questions down in the comments. Thanks for watching. Oh, hey, by the way, as a reward for watching this long, here's a teaser. I'm going to give this quad away for my 50,000 subscriber giveaway. This is not the giveaway. Don't put your name down in the comments. There will be a separate video for that. But now you know it's coming. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Happy flying.